So another research study recently published in Frontiers in Endocrinology, you see here the idea that caloric excess and insufficient levels of physical activity leads to obesity is a commonly accepted answer for unwanted weight gain. Let's pause there. However, this paradigm offers an inconclusive explanation as the world continually moves towards an unhealthier and heavier existence irrespective of energy balance. In other words, no matter how much you try to exercise, if you're being exposed to all these chemicals, you're still going to struggle. You can see here endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs are chemicals that resemble natural hormones and disrupt endocrine function by interfering with the body's endogenous hormones. Um, a subset of these chemicals are called obesogens and have been found to cause metabolic disruption such as increased fat storage. It's what we've been talking about. So let's look at um, a, little bit, a little bit more of this. So this comes from that same research study. You can see chemical obesogens and their effects on the microbiome, as I was talking about, just like with antibiotics. You've got fructose, which, you know, aside from the high fructose corn syrup being put into all the children's food and all the, um, the protein drinks and the protein shakes that are being given to children or given to adults to help them gain weight, right? Number one ingredient is fructose. Most baby formulas, number one ingredient is fructose. And so you can see here, not, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to damn fruits or vegetables um, as much as I do this processed fructose, but decrease the expression of tight junctions. Tight junctions are the proteins in the gut that prevent it from leaking. And so you get intestinal permeability or an increased intestinal permeability. And then the outcome of an increased intestinal permeability allows bacterial toxins or endotoxins to diffuse through causing systemic chronic inflammation. Remember, one of the causes of obesity is perpetual inflammation. And that has to do with inflammation causes your body to hyperproduce cortisol. Cortisol leads to increased blood sugar. It also leads to insulin resistance which leads to obesity, it's fat storage. So um, again, fructose is just one, right? And then we get to artificial sweeteners or non-nutritive sweeteners. So those of you who are diabetic and maybe think that aspartame is okay and, and Splenda is okay, that's, that's what we're talking about here, saccharin, sucralose, Okay, decrease the relative abundance of a species of bacteria called Clostridium. Okay, they also uh, decrease a bacteria called Acromancia, which is now being sold for weight loss on the market. It's a type of bacteria. They're now marketing that bacteria as a probiotic for weight loss, and it increases the synthesis of lipopolysaccharides. So what, is, what does all that mean? LPS are toxins, and when these go through, when these so let's say you're eating fructose and you're eating artificial sweeteners, you've got LPS starts to leak through your gut lining. LPS damages your liver and then your liver, which is supposed to process and help your body deal with fat when your liver's not working properly, it starts to become fatty and then you start to become fatty. So you can see here, non-nutritive sweeteners induce bacteriostatic effects on gut dysbiosis leading glucose intolerance. Um, and so, we don't want that, obviously, so keep them out. They're not good for you, keep them out. They're gonna help you gain weight, even though they're designed to be non-caloric. Remember, weight loss and weight gain is not just about calories. That whole model of calories in, calories out is very flawed and it's very limited. And then we have CBZ, which is an agri agricultural fungicide, um, and you can see your changes in short chain fatty acids result in decreased triglyceride levels, decreased the abundance of bacteroides and, and uh, other bacteria, and an increased abundance of actinobacteria. This, is, this leads to increased lipid absorption and inflammation and increased fat storage. Then we have CPF, which is a pesticide used on fruits and vegetables, why I'm so adamant about organic. Um, you can see here it causes microbial imbalance in a number of different species. We get over here, broken integrity of the gut barrier. Leads, uh, you can see the, the same theme here. You see the theme with a lot of these is, is an increase in LPS. Lipo, lipopolysaccharides 
traversing into your body, damaging your liver, causing systemic inflammation, leading to elevated cortisol, leading to increases in blood sugar, increased insulin resistance, subsequently obesity. And we got heavy metals. Cadmium, specifically in this case, you know, if you're a smoker, you're getting cadmium. Um, it can also be found in air and water, polluted air and water, and in some plastics. We also see that, you know, one of the reasons why I recommend people with gluten issues avoid rice is the high cadmium toxicity levels in many uh, cultivars of rice. So, low dose cadmium decreases diversity in early life of protective bacteria such as lactobacillus. So again, one of the predominant or preeminent bacteria in the gut. So low dose cadmium exposure, increased fat accumulation and decreased bacterial diversity, especially in males. And then we have BPA. These are the chemicals used to make poxies and resins and linings of food packages and plastics, increased abundance of proteobacteria and decreased abundance of bifidobacteria acts in a sex-dependent manner, inducing pro-inflammation of gut microbiota, primarily in females. And then we have PCBs, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls. So ubiquitous chemical pollutants persistent in seafood and poultry due to their usage in uh, dielectric and coolant fluids, increased gut permeability, so leaky gut, leading to increased pathogens and inflammation, increased membrane disruption and insulin metabolizing murine fecal bacterium, thereby decreasing uh, its fermentative ability. You can see here increased inflammation may lead to dysregulation of insulin. Um, so that obviously is gonna contribute to, to elevations in blood sugar and fat storage. And then we have microplastics, environmental pollutants commonly found in coastal oceans and terrestrial environments, including BPA and phthalates. So again, we, we're talking about BPA right here as well. It's a type of microplastic. You see, modifies the gut microbiota and induces hepatic lipid disorder, particularly in male mice. So these are animal studies here, um, but usually that translates pretty darn well to humans. So all that being said, what can we do? There's all these chemicals, this soup, this toxic soup that we're surrounded by. What can you do? And so, number one, eat real food. That's pretty easy. By eating real food, you're diminishing a vast majority of chemicals that are put in food. The additives, the preservatives, the flavoring enhancers, the sweeteners, all those things you're missing out on when you just eat real food. Number two, filter your air and filter your water. If you don't already have this in place, you know, for water, if you live in the city, I recommend reverse osmosis. For air, I recommend a good quality HEPA filter. Avoid toxic hygiene and household products. One of the best websites to cross-reference any of your household products or cleaning agents with is called EWG, environmentalworkinggroup.org. This is a non-for-profit organization that evaluates the toxicity of cosmetics and hair care products and hygiene products and household products. And so if you're not sure, because a lot of this is chemical soup, if you're not sure, cross-reference what you're using at this website and they're gonna give you a, a rating. And so you know the, the, um, the worse the rating, obviously you'll wanna avoid those things. What else can you do? Get sunshine, why? Because sunshine helps you detox. Remember, uh, fresh air is part of sunshine, vitamin D, melatonin, these are all things that help you with detoxification. And so getting that sunshine, that, that fresh air outdoors is gonna help your body expel a lot of these chemicals. Exercise, exercise builds muscle, it builds lean mass, which part of what that does is it increases your metabolism. The more muscle mass you have, the more calories you burn at rest. And so again, this is not always about calories in, calories out, but when you've avoided all the chemical toxins, it is about calories in and calories out. So you still wanna keep the exercise piece going. Now exercise also um, helps with detox through sweating. And so you can, you can excrete a lot of chemicals by sweating on a regular basis. Remember that water in your body, that lymphatic system, which helps you to detoxify, requires motion and movement for detoxification. You, you add that motion and movement to move your lymph, you add that sweat to detoxify. And then lastly here, evaluate what you put in your body. 
uh, and on your body as if, it, as if your life depended on it, because it does, right? Because we're not talking about, look, all of these things, obviously we've been being exposed to them um, for the last, you know, 60 years. Uh, so it obviously doesn't kill you right away. These are, but what, what we're seeing is the mass contribution of chemical exposure in humans is leading to slow, miserable, lack of functioning lives, right? And so we have this deterioration of quality of health, we have this deterioration of quantity of life, and this dependence to treat all this chemical exposure with other chemicals that lead to the same problems. So evaluate what you're using, what you're taking, because by doing so, you, you, know, you may not lose 50 pounds next week if, if you needed to, but it's the start, right? It's the start of something beautiful and something wonderful. Now I wanna talk about some advanced strategies next, because some of you have already done this, right? You, you're eating real food, you're filtering air in your water, you're avoiding these toxic substances, you're getting sunshine, you're getting exercise, and you're diligent, you're doing your homework and you're evaluating things that go on or in your body and you're still struggling. So let's talk about some of the things, the big factors that will hold you up. So factors that impede weight loss. Number one, is not enough exercise. Some people, and I, I see this all the time, thousands and thousands of patients, I, I've, I've heard the same thing where I, I hear, I am exercising, but then when we dig into the type of exercise or the quality of the exercise, it's not enough. You know, uh, one, two times a week, and I'm walking a mile. Um, this is a very common answer that I get. So uh, if this is you, I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying this is not enough. For most humans, one to two times of exercise a week and walking a mile a day is not enough. What, what is the motion or movement, general movement in a human? What are we shooting for? Four to five miles of walking per day. Doesn't have to be fast. It just has to be consistent. And um, you know, it doesn't have to be outside in the middle of the day either. You know, one of the things I love is a, is a treadmill under the desk, especially if you have a, a job where you have to sit all day, put a treadmill under that desk, walk at a slow pace, a mile and a half or so, an hour, and you're gonna accumulate this super, super easy. That's movement. It's not the same thing as exercise. Now, when we come over here and we look at exercise, uh, we want, ideally, most of you need this. H-I-I-T, that's high intensity interval training. My favorite style of high intensity interval training is something called Tabata. Tabata is a four minute uh, pattern, if you will. So what happens is you, 20 seconds of work and 10 seconds of rest times eight, right, which gives you four minutes. So 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. You can pick any exercise and, and do it in this fashion. So for example, you could pick a push-up, a sit-up, a lunge, a plank, a jumping jack, you name it. If you've got light weights at home, you could do shoulder presses, arm curls, you could do tricep extensions, you could do tractor pulls, you could do um, any variety of, of activity. The thing about a Tabata is it's only four minutes and you're not using heavy weights. So the risk of injury is pretty low. The risk of injury, especially if you're, if you're not in decent shape, you can start small. Um, and so you're not worried about heavy weights so much as you're just worried about consistent work. And, and in 10 seconds of rest, is not a lot of rest when you get into this Tabata. You get, it, you get to minute three and, and it's, you can really feel it starting to work you over. So a Tabata pattern exercise, which, you know, four minutes, nobody has an excuse to not be able to commit to four minutes a day. If, if, you're, if your excuse to exercise or your barrier to exercise is time, look, I get it. We all live busy lives and if you've got kids and jobs and everything else, time can be a major factor for exercise consistency, but not when we're talking about a four minute 
pattern to do it consistently. Now, what I recommend most people start with is again, simple body weight activities in a Tabata style. And I recommend you do two Tabatas, so it's really eight minutes a day. But you can do this at home. You don't need a gym to do Tabata. So there's no car time. You don't have to gussy up, ladies. You don't have to gussy up before you go to the gym. So you don't, you know, there's not getting ready time plus drive time plus gym time plus drive home time. It's just simply roll out of bed and get in your eight minutes. Do something for your upper body okay and then do something for your lower body or your core but mix that up and try to get this in i like to see people doing five times per week high intensity interval training again eight minutes you don't necessarily have to do more you certainly can if you want to some of you probably do but the key with exercise is not overdoing it too because there are some people that don't get enough exercise but then there are others that exercise too much and so what happens is exercise too much is a form, a heavy form of stress, which drives up cortisol and has the opposite effect of its intent. So exercise is also about balance. If you're totally wiped out, um, you know, take a day off. You don't, it's not like, it, it's not a set in stone thing, but it needs to be a consistent thing through your life. So Tabata is an easy way to get started without any excuses from a time perspective. As far as the movement component, this may be more challenging for some of you, um, especially if you have desk jobs, which is why I like a treadmill, um, or, or you need to, to schedule it into your day where you, where you break this up. You don't just go for a five mile walk, but you break this up so that you're getting up and you're moving around consistently throughout the course of your day so that your body gets the movement that it needs. So again, lack of exercise and lack of movement are two of the biggest factors after hearing this, go back and reevaluate what it is that you're doing and maybe make these adjustments. One of the other big impedances on success is caloric intake. And this is the classic one. Um, and the, the most common thing I see clinically is caloric intake is either too high or caloric intake is too low. And either direction, if your caloric intake is chronically too low, and I mean, let's say your calories are four or 500 less than what your body actually needs, you're gonna put your body into a catabolic state that leads to fat storage. And so basically what happens is your body eats your muscle, but stores more fat. And so you end up weaker, less functional with more fat storage, particularly ladies around your, around your thighs and your waist, men typically just around your waist. Um, but again, so you've gotta make sure that you eat enough. But then there's also eating too much, and I see that one too, where people don't even, because you, most people don't count. And again, this is if you're struggling. If you're not struggling, there's no need to count. So I don't wanna make a bunch of you think that you have to count everything every day for the rest of your life, but if you're struggling to achieve success, it helps to count. There's an app called MyFitnessPal. It's free, you can download it. I'm not being paid to say this, um, but this app helps you count, and I suggest that you tr do for seven days, if you're struggling, count what you're eating, and what you're gonna look for is your total calories, per day, and then you're gonna look at your carbohydrate, fat, and protein ratios. Okay, and what is, big mistakes I see here is when, you, when, when people count, usually they're overeating by a couple hundred calories a day or a hundred calories a day. It's not much, but they're over consuming and so they're just not being successful. They're not exercising enough and they're not, and they're not, um, not they're eating too much rather. The other big mistake I see is here. The carbohydrate um, is like 50 plus percent, and the protein is like you know less than 30 percent. Um, and so what ends up happening is this higher carbohydrate leads to fat storage. You, where do you want your 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 macros? Generally speaking, where do you want them? You want 33. 33, 33 ish. You know, maybe one day your carbs are 40 and your fat's 30, 
you know, and your, and your protein's 30. And it's, you know, I'm not saying you have to get this perfectly, but you want it to be in that ballpark, typically on a day-to-day -day basis. Remember, nature loves balance. Now, I know a lot of you that, are gone, that have gone keto and lost a ton of weight. Maybe a lot of you have even gone carnivore and lost a ton of weight. I'm not saying that, that those diets weren't successful for you, but nature loves balance. And where do we get in trouble? We get in trouble when we have imbalance over long periods of time. Nature's also resilient. Your body's super resilient. So you can have imbalance for a long period of time before disease kicks in. And we see that like the last 40 years, America's healthcare system and, and you know industrialized countries, the biggest problem has been excess carbs, toxicity, if you will. That's imbalance. And so now we're seeing you know, metabolic syndrome, heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, cancers from an excess toxicity of carbohydrates and chemical exposure. So you gotta bring balance back to that. Now, a lot of you aren't used to that, so it will seem weird at first. It may, may be a struggle at first to kind of get that balance, but this is where a lot of the magic happens, where we see our clientele um, really start dropping weight aggressively is in this zone right here. They hit this zone, they're eating real food and they're avoiding chemicals. You know, a lot of people losing 20, 30, 40 pounds in a month. So it comes really, really fast. So you wanna shoot for thinking about these things, especially if you're struggling. If you're struggling and you don't know why and you feel like you're doing everything right, you know, download this app, start counting, think about this concept and start applying it. And as you apply it, it works. And if it doesn't work, reach out to me. We'll do more strategies and future videos. So those are the top two strategies and why people fail to have successful weight loss. Look, if you've had success with no grain, no pain, leave me a comment down below. If you've had success with my protocols, that comment might help somebody else who's uh, doubting Thomas or somebody else who doesn't know quite what to do, it might help motivate them to start taking action on this information. Thanks so much for tuning in.